Good evening. And welcome to the first in a series of three sexual, uh, Civil War lectures at the New Canaan Library. Tonight we explore the Maryland campaign and battle of Antietam. This lecture series was created in partnership with Norwalk Community College's regional series of events and exhibitions focusing on Lincoln, the Constitution, and the Civil War. Many libraries and historical societies in the area are offering unique and exciting program related to these topics. And of course, all of this program <coughs> coincides with celebrations across the nation commemorating the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War. Lectures to follow in this series at this library include Connecticut's, Connecticut's Bohemian Brigade, Journalists and Artists of the Civil War on Thursday, October 18th at 7, and Lincoln and Emancipation on Wednesday, November 14th at 7. All programs are free, open to the public, details and online registration on our website. I was hoping also to have a brochure for you from Norwalk Community College that showed all the programming going on in the area because Darianne, Ferguson Library, Wilton Library, all participating in this program. The battle that took place on September 17, 1862 in Sharpsburg, Maryland is noted for both its carnage and its importance as a major turning point in the course of the war. Tonight I am pleased to introduce Richard L. Judd, who will present material on that terrible battle with special emphasis on the Connecticut units involved. Dr. Judd is President Emeritus of Central Connecticut State University, a former park ranger at the Antietam National Battlefield site, and a member of the 150th Connecticut Commemoration Civil War Committee. He continues to study this major Civil War battle. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Judd. Thank you, Jeff. Before I go further, tonight and to uh, listen to what I want to talk about, about this very interesting battle about Antietam. Uh, it's covered with a lot of graphic images, some of which are not very uh, healthy, but I think you can take them. I want to say a little word about the images in general that you will see about this battle and other battles. And remember, there was no Facebook, no Twitter. There was no social network to spread information about the battle. So the images for this battle that were done by artists, by photographers, by Gardner and others who were at these battles became very important in terms of letting the public know about what was going on, to see the carnage of the battlefield brought to the home. So newspapers and Harper's Magazine and things had sketchers that would go to the sites, they'd bring these things back, and that's how people found out about the battle. Of course, telegraph existed, but other than that, there wasn't any other way of communicating this battle except through some of these means. So let's talk about this battle to, you all have taken a quiz, and I won't give you the answers now. It's true and false, so you have a 50-50 chance of getting it right or wrong. <laughs> but during my talk, the answers should come out, and if they don't, then ask me at the end, and we'll be going. And I also will say that at the end of the talk, there is a slide that has my email on it. And if you would like to have a copy of this presentation, including the slides, uh, email me, and I'll be happy to send them to you uh, for whatever use you would like to make of them. Let's first of all talk about the fact that this battle, almost 150 years, 10 days ago, took place in the fields of Sharpsburg, Maryland. And as it has already been said, it was one of the pivotal battles of the entire war. In fact, there are some of us who think it was more important than Gettysburg. And we'll tell you why that was the case uh, as we go through. There are some historians who disagree about what was the cause of this war between the states. 
There are some that say, well, it was to preserve the Union. That certainly was Lincoln's quest. There are others that will say slavery was at the forefront. And we'd have to say that both of those issues were the important things that were being considered. But David Blight, uh, one of our more famous historians of the Civil War at Yale University, had this to say about Antietam and Civil War. The Civil War was America's first great racial reckoning out of which emerged a modern nation state. And if you take his statement here, this is really what happened. Even though people might have argued about whether this cause or that cause, there was no doubt the stake which was driven into our heart as a nation was slavery. And so no matter what else this says, my opinion of that is true. Now, as we go through, there were many, many economic issues that were involved here. Eli Whitney in New Haven, Connecticut, invented the cotton gin, short for cotton engine. And it was this particular mechanical device that revolutionized the harvesting of cotton, the mainstay crop of the South. Eli never made a lot of money out of this because people quickly duplicated his invention and we weren't as heavy with the U.S. Patent Office in those days to stop others from duplicating, but clearly uh, that was a major factor. Now, if you look at our state of Connecticut, we were also very divided about this issue of slavery and what it meant. And the current and the Hartford Times were on opposite sides of this question. Just let me quote the current here. They were talking about the annexation of Texas, quote, was against the extension of the perpetuation of the dominions of human bondage. The Times, representing the voice of traditional Democrats, said, we are Democrats of the constitutional faith, that constitution which recognizes slavery. Holy moly, Andy. It gets worse than that. The editor of The Current, Thomas Day in 1856, writes an op-ed, well, an editorial, called Sam and Sambo. And let me read that to you because it's very pivotal. It is not because we feel any burning zeal in the black man's cause that we resist the progress of slavery in this country. We like the white man better than we do the black. We believe in the Caucasian variety of the human species superior to the Negro variety. Color is not the trouble. Thick lips and woolly hair are not the objection, it is that. The Caucasian variety is intrinsically a better breed, a better brain, a better moral habits, better capacity in every way than the Negro, or the Mongolian, or the Malay, or the Red American, unquote. Well, does that give you some idea of what the big issues were in our country at the time? So as we look at this war, and as we look at what was going on with it, that was the stake. And everything that happened in this Battle of Antietam accentuated that whole issue, as we will later see as I talk about what Lincoln did uh, on the battlefield here and later in Washington, D.C. in January of 1863. Now, just because you need to know a little bit about some of this, there were a lot of names for this battle. And there are 30 at least, the Brothers' War, the war between the states, but this is the official name according to the U.S. government. And so out of this comes rebels. And this is called the OR. And it is the sine qua known of reference material. There are CD-ROM discs on it. You can go online and get them free. There are indices which will take you into it. But it's not the easiest bedtime reading. Uh, you know, it's something that you've got to study and look at, and then you have to decide whether the reports are valid. And remember, there are no reports in here of the Confederate side. These are all U.S. side. There may be references here, but nonetheless, to really get a handle on uh, this whole issue, you've really got to take a look at that battle. So politically, what was going on with Lincoln's cabinet at the time, uh, and, you know, we, have, we do have Gideon Wells here, who was Secretary of the Navy from Connecticut, but the cabinet was divided. The cabinet in those days, uh, and when you read uh, the politics of the war that Lincoln was involved in, he picked people that were all over the map on his cabinet. So they all didn't agree with him, most on a lot of issues. They certainly all didn't agree with him on the issue of slavery altogether. But nonetheless, 
this was an important factor. And out of this group, uh, Lincoln finally uh, produced the first part of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and of course, what it said was that the slaves in the South, the people who were rebelling were free, not the border states like Maryland, not some counties in then Virginia, Berkeley County and Jefferson County, which were up at the tippy end of the northeast corner of now West Virginia, because they were very much aligned with the South. And at my time down that area, Shepherdstown, West Virginia, which took a focal part in some of this battle, still until 1970, had a school mostly for, quote, coloreds. And women weren't allowed to go into the volunteer fire department. So Lincoln exempted those counties because they were politically leaning more toward the South. Uh, he also had problems because Harper's Ferry was there, and so was Martinsburg, West Virginia, which we'll talk about in a moment. It wasn't until a Supreme Court case later on declared those counties to be all of West Virginia. But nonetheless, as we look at what was going on, we also had international issues that were at the bar. Because of the blockade of the southern ports and because cotton couldn't get out of the south to England, there was a cotton famine in England. And there were riots because the workers couldn't work. They couldn't produce their cotton. So England was very much interested in, uh, well, we better recognize this Confederate group and forget the Union. France also, of course, was at the same uh, juncture point. Ed Napoleon III was very interested in recognizing the Confederacy, and he says, excuse my French, demandez au gouvernement anglais si elle ne crée pas les moments de nous reconnaître le South. To his ambassador say, please find out when the English government is going to do something about recognizing this. Now, there's a lot of skullduggery that was going on with Lord Palmerston and the Chancellor of the Exchequer and all those guys about what they were going to do here. Keep in mind that this battle also focused on that issue. So now we come to this thing called the Maryland Campaign. And it's not just Antietam that's a focal point here. There are actually three battles in one. I can only touch on the first two, but they play an important role here. Let's look at what we see here. First of all, some of you have already told me, the bloodiest day of our entire Civil War. In fact, of any battle, even up through and including ones today. World War II produced not this many casualties. 23,000 was the estimate. There's been some new research uh, done on all of this recently by a historian demographic guy who says that the percentages probably are 25 to 30 percent higher. So we may say Antietam took 30,000. Now why? Well, first of all, we didn't have dog tags. Soldiers would put a photograph or a clip in their shoe. They could buy a small medallion from a Sutter on the field and put their name and regiment on it, but there was no accounting for anybody, really. They had regimental records, but still people were lost, and they were missing, and or they stayed there, or and they died there. And the census data, Hacker is the guy I'm talking about. You'll see that in my reference, reference list if you write for it. Hacker reanalyzed that data and looked at census data and compared who was alive in 1860, who wasn't alive in 1870, went back and dug us out and by statistical analysis said, we really need to revise those figures. But nonetheless, we still have, uh, during this battle, probably 700,000, the total war, Americans killed. Now think of the impact of that, everybody. Think about the population at the time and what impact that has on families, on economies, probably more so on the south than on the north, but nonetheless, it had a massive impact on everybody. And then the destruction of property and farms and all that stuff was really very horrible for the whole American society. But at any rate, here we go on to this battle. And we see, here's one of these great sketches by Alfred Wad. Uh, they're crossing the Potomac at Cheeks Ford in Virginia. They had three crossings. And here they are crossing, here are Union scouts <coughs> watching, and it was these sketches that would get back to the newspapers to tell people what was going on. But on September 5th and 6th, probably 50,000, maybe 55,000, that's one of your quiz questions. And one of the uh, 
women in the back asked me about that. I said, well, the answer to the question is true or false. Which way it is it? 50,000, but it might have been 55,000. We really don't know. The data is hard to tell. Why is it hard to tell? Because uh, there were stragglers. Uh, desertion was high. They didn't have all the men they were coming from. But nonetheless, as Lee uh, crossed this ford over the Potomac, and this water would have been about three or four feet deep at the time, and there are several of these fords that you can still walk over today up to your knees and get across the river and find out where they were going. So here's this crew of 50,000, 55,000 Confederate soldiers, shoeless, lacked the materiel of war, lacked supplies, lacked food, had no fresh stuff. This was their first northward invasion to begin with. So now uh, McClellan, George B. himself, uh, was thinking that they had 120,000 guys. And you just say, what in God's name was he thinking about? Well, they didn't have any kind of intelligence that we have today. In fact, maybe ours isn't that good today either. But um, nonetheless, 120,000 guys, when they just had come out of the second battle of Bull Run or Manassas, and do you know, by the way, how we name battles? There are two ways. The North named them after a geographic feature ordinarily, and the South named them after a, a town or something in a town. So the North, here we have the Battle of Antietam because of the Antietam Creek, and the Confederates would call it the Battle of Sharpsburg because it was the town of Sharpsburg. If they could do it, that's certainly uh, how they identified those. But nonetheless, uh, a week before the September 5th, uh, Lee has routed the Federal's assault and Manassas and uh, forcing everyone to get back to the defenses of Washington, D.C. Lee wanted to do a couple of things here. One, he wanted to throw the Union off guard a little bit, get them off their back, get Richmond protected, and sort of threaten Washington. Now, he didn't have enough guys to go into Washington at all. In fact, Washington was extraordinarily fortified uh, by uh, barricades and the whole nine yards. In fact, the guy that in charge of that was General Mansfield, one of our Connecticut fellows, who was an engineer by training. And he did the fortification. But Washington was very frightened that the Confederates were going to go after it. Well, not a good idea. But if you take a look at uh, another map of the crossing here, again, Harper's, get a little idea of the distances from Google here. Here's the District of Columbia. Here's Sharpsburg, Maryland. Uh, we're talking about a 50, 60 mile haul to that little area. You can see the Potomac River. Whoops, sorry, guys. Uh, snaking its way down through here. And if we go to the next slide, a modern map, to give you some sense of the distances that are involved here. This would be the distance from uh, Frederick to Washington, D.C., uh, by conventional means. So now let's take about where else we're going here. These gaps, which we'll talk about momentarily, are uh, the gaps in South Mountain. There are three of them that figured very strongly in the initial part of this campaign about 13 miles from there, from Frederick over to Sharpsburg. If you went as the crow flies through Middletown, Maryland, that would be about 19 miles. And if you went from Sharpsburg to Harper's Ferry, which is right here, you'd be about 17 miles. And then you track different distances here from Sharpsburg to Shepherdstown, it's three miles, uh, over the Potomac River. There was a bridge there which was destroyed by the Union troops uh, before, so they couldn't get that way. And then Martinsburg, West Virginia, which is about 10 miles from Shepherdstown. And Martinsburg, if you follow that route on south, would be a direct line to Winchester, Virginia. Now, Lee wanted to keep that route open. He was always concerned about, how will I get back if I have to? And so he always looked at his retreats. So why did he go into Frederick? Well, number one, he wanted to get the feds off his back so Richmond could recoup. The farmers hadn't been harvesting. All that stuff was going on, and put him off guard. So the first time, he also thought by getting into Maryland, Maryland was one of those border states that would give the people of Maryland an opportunity to throw off the rack of Southern of Union uh, control. And from Maryland, once they were here, he could then go to Hagerstown, which is still in Maryland, and potentially go west into Harrisburg, PA. I don't frankly think from my reading of all this, that he really ever intended to do that, that he had enough oomph to get there, troop-wise. And Harrisburg, of course, was the 
juncture of the east-west rail connections at the time. So if you could get to Harrisburg and get that knocked down, that would have an enormous economic impact on uh, the Union at the time. But that, first of all, getting into Maryland was um, where he was going to go. Get the Army out of Virginia. Uh, have a northern victory. Why did he want a northern victory? Well, we've already mentioned to you that England and France were at the verge. That would be important. He might be able to sue for peace on southern terms, and uh, he would have an opportunity to have some of those border states join back with him, and Maryland might secede and go in. And he said, quote, the present seems the most propitious time since the commencement of the war for the Confederate Army to enter Maryland. And he offers the Marylanders a very dignified proclamation that nothing will happen to you, we won't do anything, we'll protect your rights, we're not going to ravage your land, in fact, we'll even buy goods from you, but the Maryland farmers didn't want to sell them any for Confederate scrip. So the Maryland farmers stayed pretty much <coughs> the way they were. Now, in the meantime, and there's our man Lee, Robert the Bold, audacious. This is what he had. And clearly, a brilliant general. This battle, however, tested some of his ability to exercise his commanding genius. And the other guy then we look at is George the Timid or <laughs> the young Napoleon. And as my talk will describe momentarily, you'll see why that sort of played out in this entire battle. Uh, McClellan um, was a very loyal Democrat. And the Democrats, if you listen to my earlier quotes, were opposed to emancipation. McClellan, however, was a great organizer. As a matter of fact, he was highly regarded by his men. But listen to what he said about his proclamations to the people of Virginia when he was coming in there at Manassas. Quote, I place under the safeguard of your honor the persons and property of the Virginian. This is to his troops. I know that you will respect their feelings and their rights. And to the slave owners, he says this, quote, not only will we abstain from all such interference, but we will, on the contrary, with an iron hand, <coughs> crush any attempt at insurrection on the slaves' part. Here's the commander of all of our forces making those kind of statements. Well, his loyalty to the Union cause uh, was questioned. Now, he and Lincoln did not get along very well. Uh, Lincoln at one point said, quote, trying to move McClellan is like trying to clear a five-acre field with a fart. He was a very cautious guy, and some people thought he also had a thing called the slows. And the slows, we later found out, was when cows in the summer were eating milk wort and weed wort and all those things, uh, denatured alcohol was in those weeds when it was produced by the cows, and it got into the milk. And if it got into the milk and you drank the milk, it sort of started poisoning you. It sort of started getting very sleepy all the time because of this milk wort, this unsaturated alcohol, which now was there. We didn't find that out until about... 30 years ago, by the way. So here we go. He was very cautious, and uh, he clearly, uh, you know, was not necessarily in favor of an offensive thrust for this battle. He was in favor of a defensive stand all the way along the time, as we'll show out. But I will tell you what he said about Lincoln, quote, I went to the White House shortly after tea where I found the original gorilla about as intelligent as ever, what a specimen to be at the head of affairs now, unquote. So here you have this business. He's appointed general of the army. He organizes a troop to get 90,000 men going in about three weeks, a phenomenal achievement. But many of these guys were fresh from the depot. Some of them have never even fired a rifle. But he got them on the move, he prepared them to go, had conflicting orders because Halleck, who was the Army Chief of Staff, said, look, George, I want you to go after him, but don't leave Washington defenseless. So part of his um, perhaps caution was, I have to save some troops back uh, some of this way so that if Lee gets back there, he can't get into Washington. McClellan's father, by the way, practiced <coughs> medicine in Woodstock, Connecticut. No, he wasn't born here. So here we go. He's commanding this army of 90,000, and uh, Halleck orders him, quote, there is every probability that the enemy, baffled 
in his intended capture of Washington will cross the Potomac and make a raid into Maryland and Pennsylvania. McClellan was right. Lee had no intention of marching against Washington, but he clearly had intention to disrupt what was going on with all the troop movements in the East at the time. Now, we want to talk a little bit about the important images that I told you before. And these are, these are scenes from Antietam. And as the New York Times points out here, when Brady, uh, who wasn't at this battlefield, by the way, but he hired guys like Gardner and others to take photos and set them up with dark rooms, he invested about 100 grand uh, in that time, which if you want to add inflation to it, probably worth about $21 million today or so. Uh, and they did all these works, and these got back to the galleries where people could actually see the horrors of the war here and what was going on with, with bodies, uh, which most of the people in the North had not seen except maybe by sketchings. And now they've got photographic evidence of what, what's going on. So this played an enormous uh, part in our entire battlefield. Now we have Lee marching from McCohen going from Washington up to Frederick. We have Lee, who's already over there into Maryland, in Frederick. And mindful, they've been out food for three days, no subsistence. They've been eating green corn, green apples, had no real things going on. So uh, this was a pretty important issue that was going on. Now, we take a look a little bit more to give you a, a more geographic sketch here. Uh, again, here's Frederick. And this is uh, actually Middletown, Maryland, and there's an old, old Route 40, runs right through into Boonesboro, and then Boonesboro by a side route, uh, probably about six miles, you get into Sharpsburg. Now, mindful, here he's going here, but what's going on here is a very important uh, part that I'll talk about in a moment called the Special Orders 191. But just keep this in mind as we begin to talk, but also keep in mind that we have some apocryphal, apocryphal things that happen. Here's Barbara Fritchie, who, you know, the song, Shoot If You Must, is over ahead, which Winston Churchill repeated in heart when he visited uh, Maryland several decades ago. But she was 90 at the time. And uh, even that portrait by N.C. Wise is a great piece of artwork. The Confederate new troops were never on her street, never went near it. Uh, and probably she wasn't hanging out the window because she was so ill at the time. But nonetheless, it was a, a story that inspired people that she was protecting her flag. And Lee said in his statement, no constraint upon your free will is intended. And that whole paragraph that he says, Marilyn, we're going to let you do what you're going to be doing. And so the cartoonists were at work, too. They depicted, of course, the southern guys as shoeless, ragless, and they looked like that. Uh, they were walking on Macadam Road. Now, Macadam Road was concrete-based with asphalt on top, a very tough on feet that had been on dirt roads. So straggling was a big problem, and the guys just couldn't keep up. And Lee had to do a lot of orders there. But all they were eating, as I said earlier, was green corn, green apples, uh, and they had very little sustenance, wretchedly clothed and shooed. Uh, many of us feel that as the Marylanders saw these guys coming in, which were no portent for uh, the uh, northern troops that were there, that they, you know, they were hungry and they needed to get something going on. This was a major problem. Lee knew that he had to move. He had to get out of there because Frederick didn't give him what he wanted. And he needed to find a place where he could get into the heartland of Pennsylvania where there were milk cows and pigs and food and they could, they could replenish what they had to do. So uh, keep in mind that that was uh, an issue. Now then, we begin to see this special orders. And you saw an earlier map of that. Here we are in Frederick. Lee decides he's got to get out of there. So moving out of there, he divides his troops into four wings. A very chancy thing he did here. Now, maybe against a guy like Grant or Sherman, he would never have done so, but against McClellan, he thought he could get away with it. So when you take the 50,000 troops that he had here and taking them up into four wings, up to Hagerstown, Williamsport, uh, Maryland, Martinsburg, Martinsburg, again now West Virginia, 
Martinsburg was a railway roundhouse that he wanted to control. There was a small detachment of troops there. Take him on down to Harper's Ferry, which had about 22,000 troops, a federal garrison, uh, which for some reason the Union had left there and didn't back up. So he and another group he sends over the Middletown Mountains through these gaps I talked about. So there was going to be a three-way attack into Harper's Ferry, which we'll see in a moment. Well, uh, this lost, this order became lost. One of the generals, and I don't have enough time to talk to you about it today, wrapped up the special order in some envelopes around the cigars, three cigars, three or four cigars. Cigars drop. Troops get out of there. A private from the Indiana 19th finds the envelope, opens it up. They thought they had some nice cigars, which they did. I'm sure they smoked them. And from then, they saw the order. They got it to their commanders. It was brought back to McClellan. The handwriting of General Chilton, who was Lee's adjutant, was authenticated. Right then and there, they knew, McClellan knew this entire move. Now, after the war, some of the generals produced it. One said he chewed it up. Uh, I happen to think, although I haven't been able to prove it, that his, uh, one of his uh, aide-de-camps, Henry Kidd Douglas, who was sort of a bone vivant guy from Shepherdstown, was the one that probably lost the order. But we haven't found evidence to support that yet. But nonetheless, uh, Lee leaves on September 10th. Corporal Barton Mitchell, as I told you, finds the order. McClellan knows what's going to go on. But what does he do? He tells... Lincoln, quote, in a telegram, I have all the plans of the rebels and will catch them in their own trap if my men are equal to the emergency. But he waited 18 hours, 18 whole hours, before he did anything. And this gave Lee the chance to regroup his men at the tiny village of Sharpsburg, Maryland, which was a canal town. The CNO Canal runs along uh, it on the Potomac River, about 600 people. A very agrarian community. The population today is about 690, so it hasn't changed a lot. In fact, one of the things I would urge you, if you have the druthers and you want to visit a, a great battlefield, Antietam is about the same as it was then. Very little changes, as opposed to Gettysburg, which has a lot of commercialization going along the route. But Antietam still stands pretty plain and clean, and the, uh, it, it's a great place to just go visit. And you know, from here, oh, you've got about a seven-hour haul, but to drive it, six hour, seven hour haul, but it's a great area to take part in. But anyway, here we go. Uh, the f these troops are divided, and now we have to decide what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is the first battle that takes place is the Battle of South Mountain. Uh, there's a great new book that's just come out that I certainly, uh, by Matthew Jordan, who talked about the Holy Sabbath because some of this occurred on a Sunday. And they finally figure out that the South Mountain, which runs through uh, part of the South Mountain Gap, part of the small Alleghenies, and this is part of the highway now. But there are three gaps through which people had to pass over Old Rule 40, and the gaps are separated by about six miles. The two closest ones are a mile apiece. The gaps have to be defended. Uh, Ambrose Burnside, who figures a little bit later in this battle at Antietam, is the one that's uh, going after these. And these gaps here, Turners and Fox is about a mile apart, and from here to Crampton is about six miles. And here's where we are. We have uh, the Union troops, Burnside and McClellan here, moving in. Only probably about 5,000 of Lee's troops are blocking these gaps. He's doing very well by shifting them. But then uh, by midday, Burnside breaks through the gaps. And at that point in time, uh, he's able then to almost corral, march on to Hagerstown, and stop the whole darn battle. But they don't. They delay again, and uh, clearly uh, Lee at that point is a little worried because with the gaps open, now as you see Sharpsburg over here, this is the Potomac River, and uh, if this road now, which goes into Shepherdstown, if I had it extended, the bridge is gone. There's no fording here. The nearest fords are down about here, so there's no way in which they could get across the river. He'd have them backed into the river of the battle. The war would have stopped. So the Federal had the gaps. Victor is close at hand. Lee says, uh-oh, I better do something about this. So he decides, well, he better call off this attack on Harper's Ferry. So he sends commands over. This is a picture at the time. This was the Federal Arsenal. Uh, this is what it looks like today. These are the, the heights that were occupied by 
the Confederate forces so they could squeeze us off, and indeed they did. They captured Harper's Ferry, uh, and by 8 o'clock at night, Harper's Ferry Falls, there's about 22,000 troops that are captured. A lot of guns, materials, food, clothing is also captured, and Lee then countermands his order. Before that, he said, hey, wait a minute, boys. Hurry up, get back here, find a way to cross over the river, and we're going to move our troops out of here. We're not going to make this out. But he countermands the order at 11.15 p.m. at night and tells everybody that we're going to continue on and orders A.P. Hill, the famous A.P. Hill, to get back to Sharpsburg as fast as he can. That's another story that we'll talk about in this battle. But at daybreak on the 15th of September, Harper's Ferry surrenders, and uh, Stonewall Jackson and others take that over. Not a lot of fighting went on here. There weren't a lot of casualties because it was pretty much of a sequestering move that went on. But there we go. Now we begin to look at this little battle of uh, Antietam or Sharpsburg. There were probably 10,000 engagements during this war. And many of us consider that this was the watershed uh, of a four-year war. Uh, and there's no doubt that uh, this shook the very foundation of our nation, this battle. Remember, whatever figure you believe, 23,000 to 30,000 casualties, which include dead, wounded, missing, this changed uh, where we were. So why did Lee go to this place? Well, as we will say, as you will see here, it's a 12 square mile area. Here's Shepherdstown. Here's the Ford, which is also known as Boatler's Pack Horse Ford. But this is the Ford that runs directly from the Antietam Creek. Again, three, three feet deep. It still exists today. You can go over it. But why did Lee decide he would stand here? Well, he decided to stand here because this entire battlefield, this 12 square mile area, uh, has uh, a lot of limestone outcropping. There's a 40-acre cornfield that we're going to talk about in a moment. There are fords. There are bridges, three bridges over this creek that he could defend. There was a ridge that really ran like from here. So Lee positioned himself on this side, okay? McClellan is coming in from this side. In fact, the Pry, uh, Ford Pry Farmhouse was his headquarters right here. Uh, Lee was located back over, over here. But he commanded the battlefield site from up here because he could see uh, people coming. He could see the troops moving from Middletown. He could see them crossing the creek. He could see them getting across. He had a tremendous view, and, it, and that happened all the way throughout the battle. So McClellan never uh, really had the advantage of that, but Lee did because he topographically looked at this uh, battle. So it had a lot of military advantage. Uh, the bad part of it was if he really got pushed the way McClellan should have pushed him, he'd have never gotten out of there. So it was a very critical military move that he took. But now we're on the 15th of September, uh, Lee has at the site here now about 18,000 men. That's it. Against this portent of 90,000 strong that McClellan has. And no matter whether some of them were trained or not, there still is a proportional number here that was going on. Now, this is a, an official map of the battlefield, but these are the points at which the battle evolves. And we'll start out by saying that the battle plan that McClellan drew was a good battle plan. He was going to have a, an action here, an action here, and an action here. Now, obviously, those actions worked. You're going to put a pincher move in. You're going to stop the guy from going anywhere. But unfortunately, throughout the day, none of these contingent things moved at the same time. They didn't, they didn't get across the creek, as we'll later on say, until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And these guys didn't, uh, didn't come together at the right time. And as Lee would watch those goes on, he just shifted the minority of his troops back to do that. So uh, anyway, on the 15th, by noon, McClellan certainly had at least 75,000 men at the ready, but he didn't do anything. So on the 16th, the day before the battle, artillery started out, which often is the case. And we begin to see uh, the next day, uh, there's his headquarters site, so it still exists that way today. That's all it is, a little open field. There's McClellan's headquarters, which is the Pry Farmhouse. 
which also served as a hospital uh, during the battle. Uh, these are these little uh, bridges. This is the middle bridge across the creek. Uh, these were built by the Dunker farmers, and the Dunkers were a, a group of German brethren who dunked people to baptize them. So this is about the width of a modern-day car. That's about all it is, all right, 12 to 15 feet. And there are three of these bridges. Now, mindful, uh, Lee was able to watch the movement across those bridges, or if they were in, the water here would be too deep to get in there, but not at all places. Uh, this is a battlefield site. Uh, we had a signal tower at Elk Ridge. This is part of the, uh, you can see how high it was, but there it is, and there's a sketch of it. But this, uh, this was about three miles from here. So in order to get signals back, they were either by semaphore or you sent a rider down. And often by the time a rider got from here down to there, things changed enormously, so it didn't really do a lot of good. Uh, there were some reconnaissance balloons in the Civil War, but not here. So they had no ability to, to follow that. On the morning of September 17, 1862, this is about the way the battlefield looked, foggy, overcast. Here's a shot uh, looking at the time, and that's about the way it looked uh, that morning. Uh, and you can see uh, material here, horses, wagons, and observers here. But it was pretty cloudy and overcast, so most of you couldn't see something. But what was supposed to happen here? Uh, as we begin to look at the, the movement of the troops, and I've yellow lined here some of the highlights for you to keep in mind as we're watching. Let me point them out. Again, Lee's here. This is a height here. You'll see a slide in a minute. Nicodemus Farm in the Heights is a height over here. Here's the 12th Corps, uh, which is the first corps to move in and the first corps in the morning. These farmhouses uh, play a pretty important role. The Roulette Farmhouse we'll talk about momentarily. Uh, we have uh, some of the, the Dunker Church. Where's my Dunker Church? Maybe I don't have it here, not yet. But the farmhouses are, are important points. The Mama Farm and the Roulette played a, big, a pretty important part in the battlefield as troops moved in. And along that farm here is an area called the Sunken Road, a.k.a. now the Bloody Road. So here we go with the First Corps hooker going across Antietam. And we now get a chance to look at a little bit of the topo of the land and see this 40-acre cornfield. These woods were a little more populated with trees at the time, the East Woods the Westwoods, and it's over here where the ridge is, and it's here where uh, Lee would sequester a lot of his troops and hold them there. It was here through which the uh, Union troops would begin moving. The Poffenberger Farm, uh, which is along that ridge, and there you can see this is a high ridge here with the farm below it, and that's Union artillery, uh, which would be placed, which was placed right on that ridge at the time. And that artillery opened up, and mindful, this is a grape and canister, about 69 uh, caliber. A grape and canister were shot out, and when they broke apart, uh, they would do massive damage to the body. Shell and canister is what it was called. And so if you got hit with one of those anywhere in your torso, uh, you <laughs> might, might as well forget it. You're not going to make it out of there. Uh, and so uh, these did a lot of damage to the torso. If you got hit in an extremity, you're going to lose the extremity. And so the reason we call doctors sawbones is because they cut bones off by the hundreds and thousands in this time, uh, among other things. So here we go with uh, Mansfield, who's holding the 12th Corps. And he begins, uh, General Fer uh, Kane Furrow Mansfield from Middletown, born in New Haven, uh, buried in Middletown. Uh, he got hit very early in the battle. He was a great rallier of troops. Had not had a lot of battlefield experience. Remember, I told you he was a civil engineer. Uh, but he got out there and really rallied his troops. And as he was rallying his troops out here, a uh, sharpshooter picked him off. And a sharpshooter could do well at 800 to 1,000 yards. So he was knocked off his horse. Uh, he, ra he rode up here because as things got going, it was foggy, the men got confused, and they began firing on themselves. So he rode up to stop that. But as he did that, he got hit in the right chest, uh, died the next morning in a, in a small um, place. But let me tell you what Lieutenant Fisk of Madison writes at this time. The enemy held a very large cornfield. 
surrounded on three sides. On the northeast and south, we advanced to the attack. As we came along, even with the line of the rebels, we entered a cornfield and at once were opened upon by the raking fire of musketry and a good many of our men fell. The north end of our line pressed on till we came around facing the enemy on the edge of the ravine. We opened fire and then across the ravine, firing into the corn, which concealed them from our view. The other thing that happened is that Hooker also saw this going on in the cornfield, and as the glint of the bayonets shined in the sun, he then turned the artillery and he raked that cornfield with artillery, and probably, we guess, maybe at least 5,000 uh, Confederate soldiers and Union were killed at that time. So the Union, the Confederates now say, we better get to, by God out of there, so they start moving out of here and start moving over into these West Woods. Probably about 2,200 of them or so surround this woods. Meanwhile, the Union guys are advancing. General Green begins to move this way. He's supposed to be followed by some other people here. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, but he's going this way, and he heads straight into, in effect, almost a trap uh, because he gets there, and the Confederate troops had regrouped. They come out of the woods. They slaughter 2,200 guys in 20 minutes. So uh, here we are, 9 o'clock in the morning now. Three hours of killing have passed. The Miller cornfield was a no-man's land. It had changed hands at least 12 times or more, uh, or maybe more than that. And firing had been so intense that muskets were fouled. They couldn't keep the guns going. So mindful now, Sumner's column of 5,000 then moves into this wood area. 10,000 Confederates are there, and now we have another disaster. So there's the cornfield as it looks like today. There's John Sedgwick from Connecticut who becomes mortally wounded and uh, or hit several times anyway. This cornfield, of course, it was about like that. September corn, very high, 40 acres of it. So you could see it was quite an opportune time for people to hide in it. And that's uh, what caused this problem. Now, as Sedgwick moved here, there's Oliver Wendell Holmes. That's the story, too. Now, Holmes was future Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, he was in this battle, and he was wounded in uh, the neck, left for dead. And his father, Oliver won the home senior, there's a whole long story about that, I don't have time for it, says we've got to find him. So the father comes down to Antietam, spends four or five days looking at all the battlefield hospitals, and we'll show you some of those, doesn't find Oliver Wendell Jr., but finally locates him on a train from Hagerstown to Philadelphia. He's okay, he's bandaged, he lives, obviously, becomes one of our justices of the Supreme Court. But there are a lot of little stories like that that families would come down to find either they're wounded or they're dead and bring them back home. So we go back here to uh, look at this battlefield site. This Dunker Church uh, was a site there. Uh, it was a site there because it was white, and in the morning, this is the West Woods, Coming over here to the East Woods and the North Woods, these are the Confederates here. Uh, James Hope, uh, who came from Vermont, uh, attended uh, uh, a seminary in Vermont for a little bit and decided he didn't like that, and so he went out to become an artist. He became ill so that uh, he couldn't fight anymore, so he would sketch and do maps. And these uh, panoramas, or six or eight of them, are probably the best uh, drawn things that we have of this battle. Story of them by themselves, he later goes up to Watkins Glen, New York. He has a little gallery. He dies, not a lot of money. These things are 200 pounds apiece. They're stored up in the attic. Uh, you know, they, they get wet. The rodents get after them and mice and stuff like that, but they were found, uh, and four or five of them are now restored so that we either down at Antietam, you can go see them. They're really quite beautiful renditions of there. But we don't know why French uh, did what he did. Another sketch. Again, that little church still stands today. And so as French is here, Richardson also gets killed later. French, they're moving down. Now, there's the 14th Connecticut. First time I'm mentioning a Connecticut uh, regiment here. And so this, these regiments are moving out of the woods. There's the Roulette Farm. There's the Mama Farm. There's the Dunker Church. They're coming over. This is a sort of a ridge area. I'll show you a shot in a minute of them moving over that. As that's going on, they're, walk, they're coming down here. The Confederates have hidden themselves in this road, which 
Well, I got, I'm going too fast for you, but I'll go, I have to, I'll go back. This is a sunken road, and the sunken road ran from the Hagerstown Pike all the way over to the back roads out to uh, the road to Boonesboro. It was used by the farmers to carry their goods, and they used that as a way to avoid the tolls that they would be charged if they went to the regular route. So the road became quite sunken because of the wheels, and that's why it became the sunken road. But nonetheless, they're hidden there. They're uh, split rail fences. All these guys are here. French is supposed to be, he goes this way instead of going this way, and, and Sedgwick as well. Uh, they run into this, this maelstrom of fire. The Confederates stand up. And before that had happened, uh, they also were taking pretty galling shots at the roulette farm. Mr. Roulette had moved all his family out of there to a uh, safe place. He went back, and he was cheering the, the feds on. Uh, he also was a guy that had apiaries, beehives. And for some reason, um, shots hit the beehives, and the beehives got loose on the Union troops, which caused them to scatter about a little bit, particularly guys from the, the uh, Pennsylvania regiments. That was the 130th Pennsylvania got a lot of bee stings. But nonetheless, they are advancing onto this area, the Piper Farm, which became a hospital afterwards. And there are the beehives of the Roulette Farm. There's the farm as it looks like today, somewhat restored. Mr. Roulette's family still owns it. He moved out later on and gave it to his son. He, uh, by the way, all these little things you learn, he sent the federal government a bill for the damage of his beehives and asked for $8 back. <laughs> Our government didn't give it to him. They said those beehives were hit by Confederate artillery, and we don't take responsibility for that, <laughs> among other things. A lot of the farmers, really, for some time after this, remember, there were 700 bodies buried on this farm. Can you believe it? So they couldn't do any farming, and their buildings were destroyed. And when we see, uh, uh, let me get, well, I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. Uh, they couldn't do any of their work, so they were really out of luck for quite a while, quite a while. Uh, as a result of this battle, maybe for a year. And soldiers, you know, when they were sick, they didn't leave there. They still stayed in the area. So disease was rampant to some extent. You know, typhoid, malaria. We didn't know it was malaria at the time, but uh, Mr. Roulette's uh, three-year-old daughter died of the typhoid, which she got from some of the sick troops. So the people in the area are really uh, pain and suffering. Uh, there's a wonderful book that you'll see in my reference. Uh, Drew uh, Faust Gilpin, the president of Harvard, writes about uh, the dying and suffering that came out about two years ago. It's a phenomenal book to read about how the country managed the death and dying of the troops and how all those rituals that we go through found. So I'd recommend that to you. It's a great, uh, not a long book either, by the way. So now we've got the Connecticut 14th. Uh, Samuel Perkins commanded that group. You can sort of get, they're, they're walking now. These are a reenactment group, of course, but they're coming out of these east woods heading up toward this sunken road, and Lee is able to look down on them. They're able to see them coming from the sunken road. Here's the sunken road. Jarvis Blinn was a captain killed there, uh, he says. He gets hit in the heart, and he says, I am a dead man. Uh, from New Britain, but uh, in Rocky Hill. But now you can see that sunken road is about the way it looked. There's the split rail fences. And here's another one of Hope's uh, pictures, which shows Mostly now, those are Confederate troops, uh, because as the Union got down there, I mean, they just mauled them, and they would write and say, at the time I am speaking, I can walk across this ravine without stepping foot on ground. There were so many people that were wounded, and so you get an idea, there's, there, here's where um, Blinn and the 14th were coming from, but the 14th lost at least half of its, his troop value at the time. So now, uh, this road is about 1,000 miles long. Um, one of the little stories you keep on reading about, there's a private from Middletown, Robert Hubbard, and Robert Hubbard, who was 31 at the time, he was shot and killed here. He does some writing about this before that we can tell you about, but he was buried at the Roulette Farm, and the family wrote to Mr. Roulette and said, could you find my son? And they gave a description of where he was buried near the corn shed of the Roulette Farm, and Mr. Roulette finds the body to disinter it, and uh, the Hubbard's family had sent 70 bucks to Roulette to do all this, to, to get a coffin, get him on a train, and get him back. Well, Mr. Roulette was a good guy, and he got someone to build a coffin for $15 and um, less than what it would cost for what they did, and ultimately sent the family back 15 bucks of the 70 and got their boy home. So that was a lot of, a lot of this went on. Uh, 
that way. But the Battle of the Sunken Road lasted for about three and a half hours. It certainly was the bloodiest period of this whole day, and uh, it was it was a tough tough haul. So there you see actually a gardener shot, and we get an idea of the casualties here now of that day, Bloody Lane at ten. And there's the Connecticut 14th, so um, a lot of damage. Now, I talked to you about Mr. Mama's farm. There's, there's a re, this rebuilt today, but during that period, a, uh, a done by Wad, which was done with chalk and Chinese chalk that gave you the ability to color the flames and the smoke. But the Confederates set that on fire so that the Union wouldn't have it as an advantage as they were moving across the field. Now, as we move on, it's now about 11 o'clock. This is the Hagerstown Road uh, and the battle. There it is here. I labeled it for you. Here is the battlefield sites, and the battle is moving this way across the Hagerstown Road. Again, uh, McClellan still holds back the force, and it's clear at this point in time that Lee's center had been shattered. It's been dispersed, uh, and if there were still 10,000 troops of Fitz John Porter's Sixth Corps that had never gotten into battle. And besides that, artillery, which just stayed there. If McClellan had taken that group and moved them forward, well, it would have been another time. But now we get to another point in the battle, and this is the famous Burnside Bridge. And this is a bridge that, again, runs around this Antietam Creek that I'm sketching here. You see it goes right down here to the Potomac River, and this is where you could walk across the river today. But the Burnside Bridge is, again, one of these small bridges, about 12 feet in dimension. And there it is at the time, built by the Dunkers in 1836. And notice these hills here, because it's up here where General Robert Toombs, who later became secretary, was Secretary of State of the Confederacy, but was a general here, had a group of about 400 Georgia sharpshooters up in this hill. The Union troops are over here trying to get across that bridge. Uh, here we are today, the bridge has been reconstructed, and here is the hill, and here are the lower part where we're trying to get across there. Now, this is 50 feet. This is too far to wade. You can't get in there, obviously. It's about five or six feet deep. Uh, another notable here was Sergeant William McKinley, later to become a U.S. president, of course. He was at this battlefield site. He was in charge of the Quartermaster Corps and was cited for his bravery of delivering coffee and goods to the troops during the height of the fire. But it's here where the uh, Connecticut 16th uh, gets involved. And let me quote one of the, one of the uh, colonels here, Kingsbury, who was wounded four times. The final shot hit him in the stomach, and he died uh, the next day at the Rohrbach House, which is not too far from this bridge. He says, quote, I can speak of time no more. The battle had begun, and the day passed like a shrieking shell. The sky was filled with unearthly sounds, the howl of fiendish missiles, the crash of falling trees, the horrible discharge of hundreds of cannon along our entire front. Rebel batteries were constantly discovered till a long line of cannon could be seen through the murky canopy, panting with deadly heat. So it's here that uh, Ambrose Burnside, after whom we think sideburns were named, and tombs, and here we are down in the Rohrbach area and this bridge. Now, this is the, you might say, the eastern, southernmost part of the battle. And as you begin to see uh, the town of Sharpsburg here, you can see now how far the Confederate troops have moved back. Now, you say, how far is that distance, Dick? Well, probably about a mile to two miles from where I started out with before. Not a long ways, folks. But now we're down here. There's the uh, 16th Connecticut. Uh, we have three, two other Connecticut divisions down here, the 8th. The Sherrick Farm, the Otto Farm, the Rohrbach Farm, which we just briefly mentioned, all play a part in these battles. But tombs control this area. So now if you begin to see uh, a little more photographically here, uh, here's where the Union troops are trying to get across, and here's the hill. Here's the hill they're trying to get up that hill. And uh, another nice sketch by uh, James Hope, and that's what he looked like. And here is the bridge, and here's the Union troops attempting to get across that bridge to get up this hill. Well, not a very smart move, folks. Even with nine or 10,000 troops getting across there, no matter how many times you try to get across, if you've got 400 guys picking you off, uh, you're not going to make it out of there very long. So 
we go here, and finally, uh, Colonel Edward Harland, who is out of Norwich, Connecticut, uh, a West Point graduate, a banker in Norwich, later a Connecticut state legislator, finally finds a place about a mile down from that bridge point to cross. But they don't get across here until uh, 1 o'clock. And by that time, things had shifted enormously. And they should have been out there you know, earlier in the morning getting across there. The more farm shots, that's the way it looks today. That's the way it looked then. Now, this road plays an important part. Here's A.P. Hill, I told you earlier. He's commanding the garrisons that took over Harper's Ferry. And uh, it's late in the afternoon, but he's making this seven to eight mile march in 17 hours. Amazing stuff. But remember, these guys are coming from Harper's Ferry. They were shoeless and without uniforms. Guess what kind of uniforms they had on? Federal uniforms. So as the troops from the Connecticut 8th were coming up to meet them, they got a little confused. Most of them, as I say, were not battle uh, sharp, and they got a little confused. What happens here is that the Connecticut group here, and we can see right here the 16th and the 11th, get clobbered by A.P. Hill's troops who come across. Uh, they lose about 250 men out of their 750. So confusion was high. Burnside pleads with McClellan to send more troops. Uh, remember, they had 5,000 supporters troops. They have 3,500 horsemen. Uh, they're not dispatched. So um, by 4.30 in the afternoon, the battle is over. Uh, the lines are drawn. Uh, Lee now, however, wants to still fight. McClellan has drawn the lines back, and it's about the way they, they looked in the morning. They were about the same. By early morning, uh, the Confederate Army is across the river. There's some skirmishing going on at Shepherdstown, but McClellan does not force the thing. Lincoln said, go get him, boy, go get him. And McClellan said, I have to reorganize my army. So uh, on November 7th, Lincoln removed him from command. But let's talk about what this battle was. That's the approach back out here again is coming across the river. There's the ford that you can walk across today. And here's the Confederate troops here. Some cannon stuff, some minor skirmishing, but they're heading out of here to go to uh, Martinsburg and on to, to Winchester. So strategically, the battle was a Union victory. Why? Well, it stopped the first Northern invasion. Secondly, England and France no longer ever considered recognizing the Confederacy. And it began to give Lincoln the chance on September 22nd, 1862, to announce the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. That proclamation, as I was talking to one of our, your friends here tonight, probably was the most important thing that happened politically in the war because it said we cannot sustain this issue of slavery if we're going to stay a nation. And no matter what the economy is of the South, it cannot depend on slaves. It's inimical to our democracy. And if you go back to David Blight's statement, this was the founding of a modern nation state after this battle. So from now, uh, you know, the, no the no North was very weary of war. They didn't really have a cause. Now there's a cause, and we have a new cause. Now what about McClellan? Did he do a good job or not? Evidence is divided here. I think no. I mean, he was, he was as some say, slothful. Uh, and he was too cautious. Maybe his slows really slowed him up more than he should. But he did provide for the defense of Washington because Lee never, ever again considered doing that. And I don't know if I mentioned to you, but at that time, Lincoln had a steamboat at the ready to take his cabinet out of Washington because <coughs> they were so fearful that Lee would do this. I don't know why, but nonetheless, he did organize the army. Uh, but then we, as we begin to look, there's that nice fort again. Some other things happened here. Clara Barton organized the very first uh, dispensaries to care for our soldiers. Uh, under some stress, by the way, because nobody in D.C. wanted to do it, but she got uh, materials together. Uh, they set up field hospitals, and she then organized and, of course, founded the American National Red Cross, which came as a result of some of her work here. But medical care, a whole other night of a subject, was, was uh, you wouldn't want to be there. No, no stethoscopes. 
no antisepsis. Uh, the doctors uh, didn't know anything about disease control, so you know they would. You had to have your bones cut off. They'd, they'd cut one set of bones off, and they'd use their same dirty hands to cut off the next set of bones. Plus, uh, there was malaria, there was typhoid, there was uh, dysentery, there were all these diseases which just if you didn't get it from a bullet, you got it from that. So medical care was bad. She did a great job, by the way, in, in uh, helping save lives at this battle, there's no doubt. What about Lee? Uh, my thought, he was too daring here. Made two major miscalculations. First, uh, the invasion to Maryland imposed a significant uh, problem for his men. Poorly equipped, they were exhausted, no food, no material. Secondly, uh, I believe he misjudged as poorly as maybe it was done, the Federal's business to recoup and get 90,000 troops on the road. So uh, as one historian, John Ropes, says, the decision to stand and fight at Sharpsburg, which General Lee took, is beyond controversy, one of the boldest and most hazardous decisions of his whole military career. Now, he did accomplish keeping the North out of the South for a whole year. They didn't go to Richmond, they didn't go down, so that gave everybody a chance to recoup. And then as you know, in July of 63, he made another attempt to go up to there. But James McPherson, a respected guy, says this, no other campaign and battle had such a momentous multiple consequence as did Antietam. Contemporaries recognize Antietam as the preeminent turning point of the war. And so it was. I'll be glad to take questions. Some other shots. That's uh, a barn in Keysville. It was a hospital. That's where, uh, by the way, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was cared for. And there are some of the grave details. You know, these are some of the things that were going on when we got final I told you about the hundreds of buried here. You know, another thing that we can say about this is that if Lee was victorious here, why did he leave the dead and wounded? There, you know, calling uh, Lincoln a day for twenty months. That word destruction wasn't a very good one. Uh, these are the casualties. Again, you'll you'll see all these in my paper. There's the National Cemetery. Thirty seven hundred buried there, some unknown. Uh, I guess you could some of the things that you know. No Confederates in there. The Confederates were all buried in the cemetery in Virginia. But this wasn't done until sixty seven. Thank 
trained in uh, tactical warfare and understood what we were going to do. Well, it's a great thing. 